constitutional concepts. The place and the time are the same, another dimension we call mountain high time. Saturdays, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 6 p.m. Mountain High Time, right here on Revolution.Radio, where information never sleeps and truth breaks the spell. Tune in to the Family Industrial Complex podcast here on Revolution Radio, Studio B, every Wednesday, 4 to 6 p.m. Eastern Time. Get fit, empowered, physically, mentally, and spiritually. Deep understanding must arise during these times of unparalleled deceit. A view into the depths of society upon which this country has fallen. A storm brews upon the horizon. It's been said that those that have the eyes to see and the ears to hear will play a paramount role in the furthering of humanity and civilized society. But can civilized society and humanity survive the coming conflicts not seen since a dawn of time in ages by past. But you can find true forms of information and knowledge in abundance at revolution.radio freedomsluts.com the number one listener supported radio station on the globe stand upon the right side of history hey, hold on, you've got to get us out of here now hello ladies and gentlemen this is Ryan Reynolds and you're listening to Crosstalk with Sarah Cross, a place for radio wanderers to learn about the highest laws and other related topics, with the occasional stroll through more relaxed notions. Now here's your host, Sarah Cross. Hello, welcome to Crosstalk. I'm your host, Sarah Cross. And to begin, as usual, shout out to Revolution Radio. Check out the website. All the great hosts, and if you can throw a few bucks their way, that always goes a long way in showing your support to a platform dedicated to free speech. 
This week, we are joined by Leslie Powers, and we are going to be discussing the aspects of what social workers do, the issues with interference from state-run institutions, how it holds the work back in regards to actually helping people, and how it can help people, of course, and perhaps even some possible solutions to this. Leslie also has a website where people can go and check her out. That's alive and thriving live life. And I'm going to just add the link in here into the chat. For people to go and check out. When they have some free time. And. Let me get back to my she also does. <clears throat> Hold on, I just lost my page here. Okay, so she also does the uh, girls club with me and two other really great ladies. And that's our two Britneys there. All right, so, <clears throat> so you can also find um, we we're actually going into our 11th episode with the girls club. You can also find Leslie here. I'm going to add this link into the chat as well. So go and look at all the stuff she's all the all of her work that she's been able to put together. So I will. I'm going to be watching the chat, so feel free to send any messages or questions and we'll try to get to them. And so let's get started and move into our main topic. Let's talk about the institutions and that have made things difficult for practitioners and to practice medicine due to administration policies that are taking over the healthcare process as far as the social work side of things go. So Leslie, are you there? Yes, I am. Hi, Sarah. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Hi, Leslie. Well, I I knew you were the person to come on and discuss this a little bit about. Yeah, it's an important topic. Yeah, it's a, a topic that I think for me is something I'll be talking about more um, as time goes on. I feel like it's, a, it's part of my mission um, to really um, kind of elucidate, you know, bring light to the dilemmas of the field and um, how really the social work field has become intertwined with the government, with statism, it, to such a degree that it's extremely hard to um, separate it out. And there's a lot of ways that it is, uh, the, the statist influence is really um, hold it, like you said, holding us back, thwarting actual social progress and uh, really putting a toll, I think, on on well, good people, people who have good intentions and, and really enter work uh, to help people and to help society. Yeah. There, yeah, there's a, um, a video called Liberation from the Modern Social Work Dilemma that I did with a friend, uh, Jungle, uh, that is on uh, my website and my uh, social media pages. It is uh, a conversation that led to actually you inviting me on to talk about this. So I encourage people to look at that. I also, my very first presentation, which I did for um, the Freedom Under Natural Law Conference, the number one conference funnel, uh, was on the corruption of care. And that was also inspired by my work in the field and uh, what was going on in 2020 led to me ultimately leaving um, the agency that I worked for, where I'd worked for you know nine years. Um, because of really the way that the corruption of the state um, was binding uh, the health. I worked for a health clinic. It was a attempt, they were attempting to do integrated health care with medical, behavioral health, and, and dental. But um, the mandates and such really, really warped the mission of care that that um, agency had to a point where I could no longer stay in good conscience. 
yeah. Yes, I agree. Like, I <clears throat> do not work in the medical field, but I've been involved in it quite a bit. And that was the biggest change that I saw. And I was just blown away when all the medical mandates started happening that way. And policies became how healthcare was operated rather than, you know, medical professionals doing what, you know, the best that they could. So it changed everything. It even changed everything for people who are <clears throat> often chronic patients. And I even saw a stark change in how it was all working. Yeah, yeah, it's it's kind of like um, putting the frog in the pot and then gradually turning up the heat. You know, eventually it will boil and die. And I think that what we saw happening in the health field um, in 2020 was part of that increasing the heat to change the way that business is done, right? And uh, some aspects have faded, but others have been maintained. Um, that is leading really to more constriction um, and less quality um, care. I think that um, many people in the field, who, again, are well-meaning, but have a naive and actually delusional trust in agencies that are being controlled by government policies. So there's a, there's a naive faith in the government as a solution. Um, and the agencies, all those, you know, letters of um, government agencies trusting that the guidance they're giving, like the CDC, for example, is all tr true and correct and with the best outcome in mind, you know, do, do, do these agencies really care about the people? And my my answer, my reflection is really they do not. And if we blindly follow those guidelines um, because we're told to, then we are actually working against our own ethics as um, helping professionals, you know, because ultimately that, you know, any any helping professional has a mandate really ethically to do no harm. And unfortunately, there's a lot of harm done. And, and as a therapist, I'm a psychotherapist, um, I'm a, I see today a lot of the damage that was done to people from that whole, um, I guess the pandemic, you know, through, from all of that, people are really struggling with very intensified anxiety disorders, um, depression, but anxiety especially has become very unmanageable for people. People really suffered. And I think, I think this is where, okay, I wanted to share a little bit about, you know, what is, my background is as a master's level social worker. So in mental health there's generally two pathways people go to be become professional you know professional in this area so one would be um, the masters in counseling with a generally um, a marriage and family counseling license okay the other is a degree in social work masters in social work where you would then get a uh, msw and then a license in social work so there's this whole licensing aspect, which, you know, our society values a lot in terms of um, with the, you know, in terms of finding professional care. There's an assumption that if you are trained from a, a university that you are well trained, there is an assumption that if you have a license that you are competent. And and there's some truth in that and there's some um untruth in that you cannot guarantee that you're actually um, getting the best help, you know, just because someone has a degree or a license. So I wanted to just point this out that, you know, the this uh, it's actually a fallacy to always appeal to a, a type of authority. OK, and so I see that social work is really um, it's become a field 
when really I think social work is a community effort, you know, so let's make that distinction. Is it a profession or is it really uh, something that it, we're all responsible for on some level to uh, through our care for our communities um, and and each other? You know, ultimately, I think we all um, have a, a role in the quality of of our of our social life and um, the communities. Um, the one difference with the social work education tends to be that it's more uh, systemic in its orientation. It's looking at the biopsychosocial interactions to a greater degree than, say, you know, just a master's in counseling, which is pretty myopic around the, you know, psychotherapeutic elements of helping people. Social workers tend to um, be very focused a lot on social justice, on uh, seeing um, how people are treated in the context of um, of of their society, you know. And there there's a code of ethics with that that I think is is decent, you know, a service to humanity to help people in need to address social problems, the value on social justice. OK, the rights of individuals that uh, we value the dignity and worth of each and every person. The inherent dignity and worth um, that there's a, an expectation to work with integrity, to be a trustworthy and honest person, to do the right thing, to make decisions based on morality um, and to be competent. So I think that those are good foundations now. Unfortunately, the pressures of the work in reality in a lot of the contexts, which are usually um, government funded or government run to some degree, um, puts social workers in an inherent con uh, dilemma into some dissonance between truly working towards social justice, truly valuing the dignity and worth of every person, you know, and doing proper service, you know, when we are in a system that is binding us to rules and regulations that are often anti-human, you know, um, and there's, you know, and I think that I, where I get frustrated is I think that people generally working in the field really care and um, they see that that there's a lot of bullshit going on and they want to change it. But they're um, they basically have I feel like the social work field has kind of lost its real focus on social justice and basically kind of put your head down, do the work um, in your narrow um, in, their, in the narrow um, confines of what an agency is telling you, you can and can't do. And I, um, I, um, so anyway, any questions on that so far, Sarah? <clears throat> Let me check here. I'm not seeing it too much. People might yeah. just be taking it in, hopefully, but that was yeah. all beautifully put. Yeah, and I agree with all of that, and especially the parts where, you, you know, there's a level of ethics that are meant to be maintained. Um, I mean, I did a whole bunch of history research on um, Hippocrates and the Hippocratic Oath and what that really means and why we have it. And um, so it like that was always something you know, especially the last few years, you know, where it's been clearly being violated. But do you think that this, like the analogy we're talking about with the frog in the boiling water, is it like a slow buildup into this kind of practice where it's it's not really adhering to the strict code of ethics? I think over so. like many, you know, decades even. Yeah, I think it's been going on for for decades, for sure. And and I so I got my master's in 1990. So I've been in the field now for over 30 years. 
and I can see a big difference. And I also supervise some of the newer graduates from the master's program. And what I'm noticing mm -hmm. is that they are um, very anxious about getting in trouble, having their license violated, you know, anxious about legal problems. And there, there's a much stronger emphasis, it, it appears, in the um, training around um, following, you know, following certain practices that are really not about what's right or wrong, but about what the insurance companies or the um, powers, the licensing agencies are deciding, okay? A lot of it doesn't even make sense. For example, if I'm doing therapy with an individual through an insurance and they live in California, I can meet with them. I live in California, and they, but they have to be in California in order to get the service per the, the rules, right? If they are on a trip in Oregon or Arizona, I'm technically not allowed to pay them insurance or to see them. Insurance won't pay. There's like that weird arbitrary type of, of rule. For example, I can travel anywhere. I could be in China and um, be seeing them as long as they're in California, right? So there's like a stripping of choice. And it might be that um, that individual really would benefit from that service, right? But and it puts therapists in a dilemma, you know, or let's say they move out of state, all of a sudden, if we're going to be working within the confines of an insurance company, and the insurances are very tied in with the licensing and the, um, you know, the government agencies themselves, it's all part of the structure of statism that we're in that is creating limitations. The what what's considered professional um, a standard of professionality is being defined in part by insurance companies and um, and the government as well in terms of deciding what research is uh, valid. You know that that would would guide us in terms of helping a person. A lot of it is very much around research-based practice, right? And, and I think that, that in theory, that's good, right? You want to provide services that um, have some back backup, back up, right? That they're effective. But it really does um, take away from the discernment of a clinician and the art um, of a of a provider, right? I don't need someone else to tell me what kind of therapy to do with my client or to limit me or shackle my work because I may have um, an insight into something that isn't approved by the powers that be. And and it's even those research based the things that are being approved. Those are basically businesses, you know, at this point. Their, um, their, their methods that individuals have created and put together and packaged, it's not even a really, very, very little is, is original. It's just original in how it's being packaged. And so there's all the sorts of people out there kind of putting the knowledge together into a packaged program. And then if they are lucky enough to get the money and the, the research to do the research and it gets approved within that kind of network, then all of a sudden that's on the list of, of uh, modalities that a provider can use. But but it's it's really um, not based on respect. I, I see that there's a lack of respect for the actual practice of the provider. There's there's very little respect for therapists and social workers in the general scheme of things. Um, I, I agree with that. There definitely is. They, <clears throat> and I, I've been of the benefit side of the social worker, the work that they do in mm -hmm. um, assisting me. And they like, for me, I think social workers and, and people who understand you know, really how the mind works like that. I mean, 
It's a huge benefit. And like it is it, it's not just there's different types of social workers, too. And they have all different like fields of expertise that they work in. You know, everything from doing all the paperwork and the red tape that the, you know, the the other people don't want to do in the in the business. And they like make things happen that are those extra things for, you know, the people that they work for. And like that takes a lot of time and a lot of, you know, pro it's a big process to be able to provide that stuff. So I know what you mean by the restrictions and the limitations that are put on even all healthcare providers um, where they can't, you know, give what they could usually give, you know, everything that they could give to the people who actually need it. And there used to be a time when, when people would travel miles and miles and miles and weeks and weeks just to find that one specific person who they knew could help them. And it's just now we have borders around everything that just restrict us from being doing anything or accomplishing anything real on a larger scale, I think. Yeah, it's it's hard because social workers and, and in general, I would say um, people in the helping professions are, especially if it's a government uh, agency or a government funded agency, right, where you're relying on grants and um, you're having to meet certain uh, criteria that the feds or the state or the county put in place, right, around documentation, around the site, different different types of, of requirements that require um, a lot of money uh, to meet, right? and the funding is limited right and so generally to make ends meet this the providers the social workers at such have very high caseloads and they're often thrown in with very little uh, support or training into situations so new hires very common to just get thrown right into the deep end um, and they're just trying to figure it out as they go um, they're often, it's unrealistic, the amount of um, people on caseloads. There's often a lot of pressure on quotas and, um, you know, having certain numbers of contacts, having to document and justify everything, you know, and justify it based on what standard, right? Is that standard, like, really valid? Where does it come from? Who gets to decide it? Somebody in an office somewhere, you know, completely remote. Um, it's hard to access some of the services and the services overall in our country are really uh, inadequate. The, the social struggles of people with this accompanying mental health, you know, challenges, is really overwhelming the current system. And it has been overwhelming the system for as long as I've been in the field. And so well-meaning, you know, like social workers, let's say at a, at a, at a hospital, they have very, very high caseloads. They have very little opportunity to really do a detailed um, kind of assessment. And there's very few um, often inadequate places to refer people for the support they need in the community. So the system is, is it's very disjointed, it's inadequate. Um, and I think that a lot of the people are burnt out. There's a very high likelihood of, of, of social workers having compassion fatigue, of really experiencing burnout. I see it especially in the county jobs, worked with a lot of people who fled the county. Um, and I've I've worked in like an org provider for the county and had to uh, you know so I got the firsthand trainings from the county, which again you know there's a law any time that you are interacting with a government entity as a social worker or therapist, whether you're receiving um, you know maybe payment from for Medicare or or Medi-Cal right. And if you do that, then you, you have to take these tech classes, right, around the HIPAA, which is the health, um, 
information portability act or something it has to do with privacy right but it's very much about i i did one recently and and they're threatening you like almost every other s sentence with fines and with possible jail sentences and you know they're telling you supposedly teaching you about ethics um but it's it's very much targeting the people who are probably the most ethical most of the time, okay, and are not really deserving of having to s submit yourself to these like threatening messages. I find it very aversive and it bothers me. Um, there's, it's really not principle based. It's, it's really not focused on really helping people, but more around finding ways actually for the government to come in and make your work harder, to come in and possibly, you know, it has you set up to be like a whistleblower. Like if you see any violation, you know, if someone leaves a chart out, you know, on the counter, you know, turn it in and then you have to report it. And then if you report yourself, it has you in the situation of reporting yourself so that then they come in and they take your money away for the services you're doing, right? It's very punitive, very threatening. And so that's very endemic into the, the way that the, the these government entities operate in healthcare. And we have to, you know, people have to watch these trainings on a regular basis and take their time to do that, to, um, you know, be told don't hurt people, you know, or else, you know, we're going to fine you and put you in jail. But they're very relative. It's very morally relative. Um, so that's it. And, and it just leads to this sense of like, we're not trusted. You know, we are, you can't trust your, your peers. You, you have to look out, you know, for, you know, um, anybody who's trying to take some money and might cheat the government, you know, and, and yet that's not the truth about most people. Most people are really, you know, making a lot of personal sacrifices for the benefit of their clients. Um, but unfortunately, when people get burned out, then their, their, their service goes down. And, you know, you can look at, let's say, an institution like Child Protective Services, which unfortunately is is abominable in my experience. And I've been interfacing in a few situations over the last two years, and I've been disgusted with um, the actual lack of care, um, the lack of humanity given towards parents, um, lack of proper assessment. You know, for example, if I'm a therapist working with a parent who's in that system, I have not been given any respect or even cons properly consulted to to have my input um, into the matter at all, like completely bypassed. And uh, people are doing the job that are not properly trained in mental health that don't under, really even un, seem to understand the effects of trauma, that don't understand the, the importance of a ch the bond between parent and child and the, the, the disruption and harm caused to a child who's, you know, just whisked away from their parents without proper assessment. You know, we cannot trust, people trust that these agencies are doing the right thing to protect children. And my observation is half the time, they're, they're hurting the child at least as much or more than the situation they, they're taking them from. Or they're allowing egregious things to go on and, and on and on and on and on without, you know, doing anything. But where's the real attitude of care? Where's the real spirit of help? It's not really there honestly. Um, so we have a lot of problems. And I think that, you know, when we look at the system's perspective, we have to recognize that we're swimming in um, sick waters, polluted, sick waters, you know, and we are fish in this tank 
of, you know, where the poison is slowly being put in and it's affecting us on so many levels, our food, our financial security, um, the technological risks, the EMFs, the the sitting all the time, you know, people people are under tremendous stress, they're losing their housing or under threat of losing their housing um, constantly in survival modes, right? Um, getting um, threatened, they're, you know, parents whose children are in schools are often under threat of, you know, phone calls, your child was absent, you need to excuse it. If you have too many, we're gonna take you to court, right? Um, there's generally a lack of holistic thinking and um, people in survival mode where they're losing sight of the big picture. And I, I think that that's by design. Um, Derek Brose from the Conscious Resistance um, identified some targets of attack as he sees it in, and from the larger, I guess, dark occultists, the social engineers, and they're targeting the social and emotional wellness of people through creating isolation. That was really an obvious one during COVID and the isolation has continued. So many of the services um, available to people are now online. It's, it's m almost uh, rare to be able to find a therapist in person. I, um, they're attacking our food um, and our health, the, our money, right? And, yeah, and very much I, so our children. Yeah, I agree with all of that. It is like, a, it is, that's a good way to put it. We're in a, it's like we're in swimming around in dirty waters and it's all being very tightly like controlled and like one of the things I noticed just being somebody who has to like be on that kind of um inner circle as somebody who's on the chronic side is that every time and it is all like it seems to be all almost entirely like where the insurance companies they're mm -hmm. the ones who are kind of controlling it all mainly and every time you have an administrator policy change because one thing changed at the beginning of the year and you don't find out about it months and months later all help all breaks loose and it just goes crazy and it's like one little thing and all of a sudden it just like breaks all like the way you were doing it before and you have to change everything and it makes it very difficult and if you don't have somebody like a social worker who really understands how to operate that aspect of it then it can be very complicated even for like the common man. And yeah. that's one of the things I find really frustrating. And I, it's just, it makes it very difficult. It makes it so that what it feels like is you have to go to what you would want to be. You want to feel like people, these are trusted authority figures on the subject. They know what they're doing. They studied it. They went to school for it. And then you kind of feel like you're being, you know, put in a box and been like, well, you'll get what we give you. And that's very frustrating for me. But and yeah. I agree with everything that you said. Yeah, I think a lot of times social workers are in the place of of, um, of like commiserating with their clients about how crappy the the rules are, you know, that limit the service that they can receive or the that breaks the continuity of care you know and you know i have clients who i who who are engaged in the medical system and having all sorts of challenges and um and, and a lot of time is is me offering support for how difficult it is for them to navigate the medical system and um and the, there's a real breakdown of of communication and real teamwork if because of the compartmentalization and in yeah. generally you know the medical pro providers aren't trained well in mental health they're not um, they don't have the same mindset they often minimize 
you know, the importance of, of that, the emotional aspects of a person's um, experience. And, um, and so there's this disconnect and we become more separated, more compartmentalized. Um, you know, social workers, you know, or mental health people are often trying to find the workarounds and the creative solutions and, you know, trying to leverage the systems and it's a lot of work, right? And it's unnecessary. It seems just so unnecessary um, if things were running in a functional way, I guess. I agree with that, Leslie. I see it. I see it with even my own doctors and other doctors and nurses where they're just like completely overburdened because it's so, it's such a mess. It's such a huge mess. And um, it needs to, you know, I feel like we can't lose the healthcare system. We can't lose a healthcare system. It needs to be ran on a moral and ethical standard. But what we have today is really a burden, I think, on everybody, you know, patients and providers alike. Because you're right, it's like the majority, they go into the fields of the medical professions and like, there's, you know, that sense of, you know, genuine, like, I have this obligation to help humanity. And most people go into that field with that, I think. Yeah. And I think the medical system, like medical schooling, kind of drags some of that, you know, sense out of some of them. Yeah. And then I think you have like that very tiny portion of psychopaths who enter into the field and then they they don't make it any better. And then you've got the I've noticed it a lot. And maybe you have I mean, I'm sure you have is where different um, sections of like professions like surgeons talk, you know, surgeons are like homies with surgeons and specialists for like heart disease or homies with specialists mm -hmm. with heart disease. And all so on and so forth that nobody really mixes unless they have to you know and nobody wants to like be part of that overall team yeah so i notice that a lot yeah for sure and again that's that compartmentalization and the you know it makes sense in a way that people gravitate towards people who get get their work that get them right and 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 we need specialists and we need um people from all angles right to help with health be but i think what's missing is the the holistic um fabric right that links it all together and and that the the deep understanding of mind body spirit is is all one unit and you can't really separate the body from the mind or the spirit from the body that that there's so much more to health and healing than just um, the physical procedure or just a psychological intervention. Right. So there's these, you know, research based interventions and you can be an EMDR therapist or an IFS therapist or do cognitive behavioral therapy and kind of get in your wheelhouse. But that's just one aspect of helping people. It, no, not one thing um, addresses the whole person's needs. And if a person is living in, you know, poverty and worrying about paying their bills and, you know, being kicked out or having to deal with, you know, potential crime and their neighborhood and worrying about their kids being safe, you know, those techniques are not going to solve the problems. And people take a lot of shame really about their symptoms and and are not wrecking and then start to think it's about a fault in them when really it's very much just a reflection of a much bigger problem in our society um, that is being perpetuated and worsened by um, the powers that be by the system itself um, and I wanted to add something to just point this out that I think it's something I've noticed recently even more. I mean, maybe obvious to many is that a lot of the helping fields, these professions generally are um, w dominated by f women. So women are drawn to the helping professions, social work, therapy in great part, um, um, uh, school, teaching, right, nursing. 
And because there is an intrinsic um, tendency, quality in the feminine to nurture, to care, to be relational, right, and wanting to help. Now, I see it but also a uh, parallel here that these are fields that are generally underpaid, undervalued, inadequately resourced, and just sort of take and that the people working within are taken advantage of. Um, and really strained and stressed to a max. Um, and I find that to be a very, you know, a, a telling sign about the values of our um, of our system, you know. So we're turning to the government, right, to be big daddy, big mom, to provide all these services, right, for the people, supposedly to help the people. And yet, it, it's inadequately supported. So do they really care about the people? You know? Yeah. I, it, it doesn't it, seem so. That's a great point to even bring up because it's, um, it, and if people ever read, of course, a lot of people have read the book 1984, but if you were to reread it as an adult and really um, analyze it, it, the whole entire system is based on not just like government control, but institutional control. So like everybody is only like allowed a certain amount of action as far as like whatever their profession is. And if they go outside of that, they get punished for it. Yeah, and I thought that was a pretty funny thing to think about. I'm like, oh, my gosh. You know, when I read it again as an adult, I'm like. Oh my gosh, it was like a totally different story to me because I I can see it. So, I mean, and with, but yeah, I mean, I agree with everything that you said, Leslie. Yeah, I think in the social work ethics, that aspect about um, seeking justice, right, is, is not being emphasized so much anymore. Because, the, you know, this field was really, I think, created on activi activism at a grassroots level of concerned citizens, people who cared about the hungry, that organized ways to feed the hungry, you know, that, you know, there's, there are cultures, for example, that worked together to help support other people in their culture. It's it's common in the Asian cultures, for example, where families may come together and a community may come together and create a, 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 a pool of money to then uh, offer to the family members to then go start a business, you know, for example. So, or, or there's been times when people put together a, a pool of money to then buy health insurance. Now that is not legal anymore. You can't privately create your own health insurance um, program. You have to go through the institutions that have been deemed uh, in charge of that, right? So that's another example of a law that's morally relative that is really built for the profit of those companies that is holding back um, people's ability to maybe get health coverage, right? Um, there's, and yet, so we should be complaining about that, you know, as professionals, when we run up against these uh, both immoral and irrational types of um, of laws in the system, rules in the system, that we need to start speaking out. And I, I, I think we need to push back in agencies, in institutions against, to call out, point out the immorality of the, the rules, so to speak, you know, and to stop complying with them to stand up and ultimately leave those institutions. I really think that there's no saving or reforming the system 
we I think the solution is to get out of it and to start going back to grassroots level of how do we take responsibility as citizens to help each other. I agree. I mean, I think it is vitally important. I always talk about this and sometimes people get mad at me, but I'm like, you do have to take personal responsibility for these things, even if you are relying on others to assist you with achieving something, especially like healthcare, and that people can't come together and yeah, do what you're describing, you know, pulling the money together so you could have some kind of insurance or, you know, like I hadn't heard about that. I'm going to have to go and look more into that um, aspect there. But even the idea that like in some places or they're trying to or it is um, that it is illegal or something not to have health care insurance, you know, for people who choose not to have health care insurance. Right. And they're they're trying to make it so if you don't have health insurance, like California is the worst for this kind of stuff, exactly. that you're going to get fined yeah. for not having, having something that should be 100% your choice. Uh, because there, there are people who go 100 years and they they – get a scrape or they do they just don't get sick or they just don't care they you know they just aren't going to go to a hospital whether they get sick or break a bone or whatever they're just yeah not interested and yeah and the idea that like even if they got sick once or broke a leg or whatever and had to go to a hospital they're like why can't I just pay for that why can't I just pay it for it I can just pay the bill yeah. and they're like no 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 we can't just pay the bill like that you have to have insurance so it's like completely controlled. And like, that's why I feel like a lot of it is coming um, a, con a a system that is designed where the medical insurance companies are all kind of, you know, maybe not the people who are like working the phones when you call up a company or whatever, but like the people who are designing the, the medical companies because they're corporations they're not even like part they're not even into the healthcare system so it's like so many parts of the aspect of the medical industry are not even part of the healthcare system even yeah it's true yeah it's a really good point about like mandating that people pay into and and have health insurance that they may never use nor or ethically ag agree with right you know and um so there's a lot of coercion and people are essentially complying out of fear because they're under duress. It's coercion. They don't want to get in trouble. They don't want to get fined. Right. The whole tax system is but, but built on that, on fear. And I think that that's the spirit with which, you know, a lot of people who are working in, you know, institutions where there's social workers and you know, that the, the employees are feeling like, oh, I just got to do it. That's the rules. That's this is the way I don't want to get in trouble. Right. And and it becomes like an automatic behavior. And everybody kind of thinks it's dumb to go through these trainings and, you know, complain about it and don't like it. But um, generally people are doing it because they're compliant. Yeah, and they become rule followers, essentially, rather than thinkers and rather than independent activists, you know, and people are not comfortable speaking out in group settings, um, especially if you're a minority, because, you know, most people are sort of still bought into this idea that the daddy government is good and that that's the way it has to be and, you know, so it's it's a minority, you know, those of us who are speaking out that are not complying, um, that are leaving these corrupt, you know, um, entangled institutions, you know, we are the minority. So we, we, we need to have courage. We need to be really clear on our uh, moral foundations and um, be willing to step out there, which I think was the true spirit of social work in the beginning. It was to stand up for what's right. Um, to care about people, to care about relationships, to recognize that everything is based on relationship. Health is based on a relationship to yourself, to others, to spirit, to um, your food, to 
your job, you know, and we need to look at the nature of our relationships in order to find true um, health and escape from tyranny. Yeah, I agree. <clears throat> I think people would be wise in practicing, especially confidence. Like confidence has a big role to play in all of that, where, you know, it's not just the providers, but the patients, the people who are the recipients who need to understand that they should have confidence enough in themselves to understand where they want us all to be at. And, you know, social workers are in that position where they are being, you know, you know, gifted our tr gifted the trust of the general mm -hmm. public in finding every way to assist them. And, you know, mm -hmm. in all the things that the people who don't know about the stuff would ever know about without a social worker. So <clears throat> I find social workers to be highly valuable and should be far more appreciated than what they sometimes seem to be. Yeah. <laughs> they have a lot to offer generally, I think. And generally, yeah. you know, like case manage social workers doing case management and stuff, they're, they're really good advocates, you know. Yes. Well, mm -hmm. you know, you need an advocate to, to maneuver the system, you know. But it's sad, you know, that that's where the energy is going is into maneuvering the system. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and I'll tell you really quick, what just happened with me is that um, I have to use oxygen every night to sleep with and i've done that for i don't know something like four years or something like that um and just recently some little policy some little line was changed and it just went all crazy and they're like oh well we have to take it all your oxygen away and da da da, da and like all this stuff right and i'm like i don't know how to fix that <laughs> And so my social worker who works on my medical team came in. She's like, don't worry, I'll fix it. And I mean, I got to give her like all the props in the world because I was getting all kinds of like, um, oh you know, messages, like calls and stuff from the service that provides it with like threats mm. over it. And I'm just like, oh, okay. And she's like, no, that's not even legal. And so she goes in and she does her magic. And she's like, she calls me back a few weeks later. She's like, oh, they'll be dropping off the new stuff next week. Yeah, thank goodness, right? Because that's so, like I mean, almost a life or death situation. Yeah, and it's that magic. And social workers, like, nobody should look down on a social worker because they know how to get in there and you're right that it comes down to having to maneuver a system that they shouldn't have to maneuver because it should be running ethically that is a sad state of affairs right there it is it really is and um you know we're looking for you know some some people who care enough to um start to challenge the status quo and push back a bit from this beast you know that is kind of i feel like like driving over you know it's like steamrolling um the field of healthcare in general and definitely in mental health you know it's um you know what there's so many factors that are affecting mental health and that are not being talked about and not being addressed the real systems issues the social and economic and um you know the whole government is sla is is slavery issue <laughs> you know um that you know that people are are overlooking as they're kind of myopically in this bleeding out system right trying to just um help people on an individual basis which is wonderful and I think helping every individual, you know, is, is a meaningful thing. Yeah. And that's our cue today, guys. Thanks for listening and join me next time. I will get more information about Leslie Powers in the chat. See you next time for another rambling on cross. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Thank you for listening to Revolution Radio. Radio. 
Join me and the Brian Rue Show on Revolution Radio, Eastern Standard Time, every Tuesday night from 6 to 8. We talk about the four most vital things, in my view, affecting